So there's a, a, a novel, a short novel, which no doubt wasn't at all widely read from uh, the 1880s, called The Last Man in London, by someone called Delaval North, which describes a man, a bank clerk, waking up one day, finding his house empty and heading out to work, disconcerted to discover that the streets around where he lives in the suburbs are empty. There's no one around, there's no tram to take him to work. The further he penetrates into the city, and the closer he gets to the city with a capital C where he works in a bank, the more he realizes that some unbelievable apocalypse has taken place and that there is no one whatsoever around. And he spends days traversing the city, running around trying to find people and never does find anyone, getting more and more distraught. Now it turns out in the end that this is a, a long, sustained, psychotic episode and that what has happened is that his family have been killed, have died in tragic circumstances, uh, and that he has projected that sense of loss onto the city as a whole. ambivalent about the city. I mean, I think in, you know, in many ways, London is as destructive and as wasteful and polluting and kind of grim. But at the same time, I kind of love it as well. I'm, I'm kind of in love with its anarchy and its, its formlessness. London's a very appealing city in that way because it's so unplanned and so kind of protoplasmic. But I mean, most of my kind of psychogeographic stuff, for want of a better word, is concerned with inhabiting the city in a human way as opposed to inhabiting, inhabiting it in a physical way. Because I think so much of urban living is dehumanizing, is concerned with people being very static in the city, sitting in cars, sitting in front of computers, moving around the city in ways that they don't really understand, not understanding the shape of the city or its topography. The old men say their fathers told them that soon after the fields were left to themselves, a change began to be visible. It became green everywhere in the first spring after London ended. You know, Richard Jefferies imagined, wrote a novel called After London in the 1890s, which, which hypothesised a kind of post-apocalyptic southern England in which London had kind of melted away into its own kind of polluted muck, creating an enormous swamp, an enormous sort of toxic swamp, and the rest of the country had kind of reverted to a prelapsarian kind of arboreal world. All sorts of utopian thinking is quite clearly bound up with the idea of the end of the world, at least as it is now. Uh, and it's r radical uh, replacement by some other mode of life. Uh, and I think that's implicit. And even kind of quite horrible dystopias are at least ways of imagining things as being fundamentally different. I mean, the two most famous English dystopian novels of the 20th century are like that, Brave New World in 1984. I think there's always a utopian moment in dystopian fiction or cinema. However bad things get, there are always glimmers of, of, of hope. I think there's a utopian impulse that's structural to dystopian literature. The late 19th century in England and America and also elsewhere in Europe was the boom time for utopian literature. Uh, there was this sudden massive upsurge in utopian writing and it became a viable and even a, a mandatory political discourse, particularly on the left, but also on the right. 
not least because of the publication of a book in America called Looking Backward in 1888 by someone called Edward Bellamy, which started the whole trend really. And I suppose one of my arguments about utopian literature more generally dystopian literature too, would be that it's always an attempt to historicize, that it always involves a, a look backward, that utopian and dystopian novels and films situate themselves in a more or less distant future, precisely in order to historicize the present. The only thing wrong with the present is the bastard doesn't exist, because the present is the future and the future is the past, and it's all the same fucking bag of bones anyway. But the present does exist. We're in it now. You were just then when you said it, but you're not in it now. You're not in it now. You're not in it now. You've never been kicked up the ass by the future. You with me? I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, you read Ruskin, for example, writing about the despoilation of the countryside by the expansion of British cities in the second half of the 19th century. That was felt at a visceral level, a level of a kind of visceral impact. In the 19th century, you have a shift from probably I don't know, less than 20% of the population to more than 70% of the population living in urban contexts. By the time you get to the end of the 20th century, that's done and dusted. You know, most people sit in urban contexts, often living large part of their lives in, in virtual contexts. You know, their sense of uh, environmental despoilation is very, very decontextualized. They don't really understand it within its context. Their encounter with the natural world is mediated through commerce and through <laughs> film. They're not like Ruskin weeping as he sees a road being dug. I mean, lots of utopian and indeed dystopian novels build in a utopian moment which is centered on tiny, more or less tribal, band of people who represent the nucleus of the future society and who are microcosmic, if you like, who are sort of metonymic of the ideal society. So one might even take an example like the Day of the Triffids, which ends with the colonisation, if I remember it rightly, of the Isle of Wight, an island off this large island, which represents the possibilities for repopulating and refounding society on new values. Twenty-eight days later would be another example where there's a glimpse at the end of this rural context in which a new society might be reborn. The horror of the overcomplicated city which has been blessedly cleansed by rage and that all ends up as this ruralist fantasy in a, in a sense about uh, the origins of a new possible new society. Go! Jeffrey's often rambled up to the stone which stood under an oak to look at the chipped inscription low down to London, 79 miles. The inscription was cut at the foot of the stone since no one would be likely to want that information. It was half hidden by docks and nettles, despised and unnoticed. And going back to what I said about Ruskin, I mean if you, as I do every year, I walk out of London on foot well then you can get an appreciation of the impact of the city on the natural world or what passes for the natural world in, in southern Britain because actually it's an entirely human created landscape in many ways. I certainly think in post-industrial society and since the industrial revolution there has been a kind of sense certainly in the West, that things can't go on this way. There is a sense of kind of uh, activities of civilization being, in some sense, self-destructive. What has this progress, this world civilization, done for us? Machines and marbles. They've conquered nature, they say, and made a great white world. Is it any jollier than the world used to be in the good old days, when life was short and hot and merry and the devil took the hindmost? One of the few positive consequences of the economic crisis since 2008, it seems to me, is that the argument, the neoliberal argument, that the free market 
as utopian potential or even represents a utopia that capitalism is utopian has been completely destroyed the very fact that we're all talking about capitalism again is itself an indication of that it's always worrying in periods when there isn't a sharp economic crisis or a recession that people don't talk about capitalism it's so woven into our everyday lives it's so much a part of our lives uh, it's so taken for granted it's so little needs ideological justification by the ruling class that we don't talk about it it becomes almost invisible inaudible what economic crisis and recession does is it brings capitalism per se back onto the agenda and as soon as you're talking about capitalism then you're talking about a system that has a history that has a beginning and an end, uh, and that may in many ways be amorphous and complex and difficult to decipher and difficult to control, it nonetheless is an entity, it's a phenomenon with a historical shape to it. So as soon as one starts talking about capitalism in a sense, then one gets to talk about the end of capitalism. The future is always about the present, <laughs> you know, and the present concern has been up until the banking crisis of 2008. The preoccupation was with the environment and with the idea of environmental destruction. That's gone now. We're having banking apocalypses. I mean, they're obviously not going to have the sheer physical destructiveness or sense of the kind of world laid waste that you get with a decent environmental <laughs> catastrophe. But you're going to get a lot of kind of civilization breaking down and people going to the cash point and nothing coming out and then sort of whirling around and eating their neighbor. We're going to get an awful lot of that. I mean, come back to that. Point that gets quoted quite a lot these days, Slavoj Žižek, I think, got it from uh, Fred Jameson, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, I'm not sure that that's quite so true anymore. For nobody will escape the mark of the beast when it comes. Just immediately after the bankruptcy, when the bankrupt the world in the near future. And I think one of the pleasures of apocalypticism is there's a sort of survivalist impulse if you like behind many of the apocalyptic fantasies and fiction and film that we're seeing at the moment if you take a new a band of people a tiny group of people a kind of tribe in a wilderness or in a post-apocalyptic city then you've got an elite that it also happens to be the entire society and that way you can get round the issues of how democratically you get from say a capitalist society to a communist society or at least a, a post-capitalist society and i think it's always troubled humans what kind of progress would look like sort of unlimited progress i mean you get theories of speculative fictions that deal with the idea of humans becoming cybernauts or robots or you know, very early on i mean they're they're happening in the 19th century i mean it's sort of people already understand that there is a limit to the perfectibility of the human form therefore it'll have to be a kind of transhuman form and that loops back to earlier narratives i mean you know if you if you choose to regard religion as a kind of narrative then it's already implicit in religious narratives and in the ideas of the book of revelation and what happens to us after death
It's part of a triptych that John Martin created towards the end of his life, and the other scenes are uh, the claims of heaven and the, and the last judgment. So it's a kind of a, a sequence that deals with uh, the book of Revelation and the end of the world. If you're one of the good people, if you read your Bible and you go to church and you, you know, live a good Christian life, this is what's promised to you at the end of time, as you get you ascend into um, heaven and the celestial city with its um, huge domes it's, uh, rising in this uh, uh, sunlit, blazing distance. And the promise of Apocalypse was about a world in which um, everybody was equal and everybody was leveled. And in the pamphlet that John Martin drafted to accompany these pictures, there's a lot of emphasis about, um, at the end of the world, how um, all races and all classes will come together uh, and the people who are punished by God, the people who are sent down into uh, the abyss and uh, you know, uh, hell are the clergy and merchants and businessmen and bankers uh, and uh, uh, you know, soldiers and military men, so that sense of materialists and materially concerned people, they go to hell. Um, the good people uh, are going to go to heaven. The kinds of critical analysis that we bring to historical art has tended to be secular. The promise of democratic um, a heaven had a much stronger hold on the 19th century viewers of these paintings than the scene of the end of the world itself, the scene of the great devil's wrath and, and the world torn apart. And yet now, perhaps because the painting's been on show for a long time, but I think also because what John Martin does with The Great David's Wrath matches up to the kind of aesthetic and cultural concerns of, of the post-war era much more than The Plains of Heaven. Uh, now it's The Great David's Wrath, which is the picture which seems to fix our attention and to interest us. Religion has such a determinate influence on politics and geopolitics at present that in many ways notions of religious apocalypticism are probably coming back and that's if anything more true of Christianity than it is of Islam I'd say I mean if one looks at Hollywood disaster movies clearly they are secular ostensibly but it would surprise me a great deal if America didn't produce apocalyptic fantasies in mainstream culture in Hollywood say that weren't to an extent shaped by Christian millenarianism that uh, is a feature, for example, of the Republican movement. This 1856 Maryland history textbook contains a story about George Washington that you've probably never heard. It's a story of how Washington's life hung in the balance for over two hours and how that only by the direct intervention of God was it spared. We'll get to this story in just a moment. In the States, it's a kind of strange interjection of the concept of manifest destiny, you know, the idea that the American nation has a preordained destiny to be ever expanding and to be more powerful and controlling and is, is a kind of repository, you know, it's an eschatological theory, a theory of the end time of America that it should have this. But again, you know, of course it's, it's very much rooted and it's not without accident, the kind of concepts of the rapture and kind of fundamentalist Christian ideas of the apocalypse are very, very prevalent in American culture as well. I mean, we don't have, really have that kind of thing over here. At least not in quite that overt form. Where's the president, Sally? He said he wanted to spend some time alone. I think he's over at the chapel. He's got to go to church now? He's praying, sir, which under the circumstances is not such a bad idea. 
John Martin is an entertainer and the way he uses apocalyptic theme and apocalyptic, apocalyptic imagery, it doesn't stem from any set of personal beliefs. I mean, John Martin was not a deeply religious or eccentrically religious person. As far as we know, he was a rationalist and he was kind of aligned himself with scientists. His interest in apocalypse was very much about addressing a market, addressing an appetite for apocalyptic imagery and imagery from, from the book of Revelations and biblical imagery more generally. The lust for destruction, sort of pure destruction, has a kind of creative tinge to it. It makes people feel individually, paradoxically creative, seeing the world destroyed in these speculative fiction. The most widespread danger is fallout. Fallout is dust that is sucked up from the ground by the explosion. Fallout can kill. I remember seeing a, a BBC drama called Threads in 1980, I think it's 1983, which is a really kind of scarring BBC drama um, about nuclear war descending upon um, Britain um, and Sheffield in particular. As yet, we haven't located all the root vegetable clumps on local farms, but stocks of sugar, wheat, flour, and rice are quite good. And there's a sequence where the BBC Special Effects Department tries to recreate a nuclear uh, attack on, on, on Sheffield, which, um, you know, it, it's a bit creaky, it's very 1980, whatever it was, um, but it still works. And one of the scenes within that sequence is Woolworths being blown up. Woolworths, the, you know, the British institution, being flattened by a nuclear blast. Bloody hell! But now, in between, of course, you've had 9 11 and you've had uh, the tsunami and all the way in which any experience, any learn that disaster is immediately recorded and circulated uh, and that has doubtless shifted things as well. The sense of watching the footage of 9-11 and feeling that, you, that this was something that was before had only ever been seen as a special effect. I think that it's a way of people managing fear and anxiety like so many narrative stratagems isn't it? It, it acts as a catharsis, you know you kind of see a blockbuster Hollywood movie full of CGI that seems to show London or New York being destroyed by a wall of water or kind of disappearing into a chasm and it makes your own rather more workaday anxieties rather sort of pale in comparison. It makes it easier to cope with one's own position in society which may not be that advantageous. You know, there's a kind of you know, sort of cosmic schadenfreude bound up in it, you know, I may be at the bottom of the pile, but the whole pile's going to be kicked to shit anyway. Yeah, Post-apocalyptic imagery gives visual or narrative form to what uh, many people experience in the modern world itself, that sense of isolation, that sense of needing to survive without support of people around you. And if that is the case, then that, again, is taking, taking us a long way from John Martin's original audiences who could have expected a sense of community and could have expe expected some sense of a religious underpinning to, to, to the end of the world and if they were Christian people then the apocalypse is not actually a bad thing. <laughs> the apocalypse is, would be something to be welcomed. Now is the end, perish the world. It was GMT wasn't it? <laughs> The idea of the apocalypse returns us to the body. But of course, our common understanding of apocalypse tends to be that even if it's going to destroy everything, there's some sense in which the material destruction takes primacy over the destruction of humans. You know, the, the kind of archetypal image of Pompeii or of Hiroshima is of the outline of a human being left as a sort of scorched silhouette on a wall. But that still suggests to me that the human takes primacy in human destruction in that way, only contingent on human awareness. In other words, you have to have a human to see the human silhouette on the wall. So it's not really the wall that survived, it's the idea of the human. I think that's why these apocalyptic narratives have psychological rather than practical meaning. It also, I think, is expressive of a, of a longing to start again. A sense that historically, and this is perhaps particularly pertinent at a time of global economic crisis, a sense that life, that the economy, that politics have become so elaborate, so over-complex, that we need to start again. There's this sort of 
great cleansing sense that you can you can clear the city of all its historical debris of its overcomplicatedness of its sense of perpetual of everyday of mundane crisis and somehow start again and i think that's always informed apocalypticism that desire to get rid of everything in the past that accumulation of historical debris. I think people realize that whether or not at the conscious level that what a certain kind of avant-garde of science seems to offer, which is kind of unlimited plenty, ever increasing numbers of people, increasing lifespans, increasing standards of living, etc., it cannot possibly be fulfilled. And the sort of backfill of that of that kind of tunneling into the future in that detritus is, uh, are these apocalyptic fantasies. That they're there as a corrective to that kind of view and as a way of understanding the kind of finitude of, of human endeavor. All right, I'm not saying that life will end or the world will end or the universe will cease to exist, but man will cease to exist. Just like the dinosaurs passed into extinction, the same thing will happen to us. We're not fucking important. We're just a crap idea. I'm not going to cease to exist. I'm going to be here in the future. What is this fucking fixation with the future? And I'd argue that London is about to be cleansed um, in class terms. The, the, you know, the Tory housing policies, uh, the fact that all the rents are going to get pushed up, is going to mean that working class people are just not going to be able to live, able to afford to live in, in, in the centre of London. So the whole social configuration of the city, at the very moment when, during the Olympics, the city is supposedly showcased to the world, the whole configuration socially of the city and its, its social topography and geography is going to be altered uh, for the worse. So there's a kind of apocalypse going on there, it seems to me. That, you know, in the dreadful everyday sense of the word. While I think that apocalypse has been a perennial in culture, and I do think this is a significant shift from, as it were, god apocalypses to human apocalypses, on the other hand, in the post-Enlightenment, really since the, since the European Enlightenment, we're the only civilization that has considered or entertained or even swallowed entire the idea that we could just go on. All previous civilizations have accepted you know, that they would rise and fall. And the apocalypse in that context is, is actually perversely a way of glorifying Western civilization, you know, we, we're like the banks, you know, we're too big to fail. <laughs> so, you know, what has to go with us is everything.
you know, one of the motifs which recurs is the last man, the idea that there's the last man who is witness to the absolute end of the world and he's the sole survivor. And that you can see, you know, Mary Shelley's novel of 1826 and Thomas Campbell's poem, The Last Man, and a number of other fictions from the you know, early 19th century, through to the Richard Matheson um, I Am Legend and the films after that. The idea of the sole witness who stands in front of the obliteration of everything. A lot of apocalyptic imagery, post-apocalyptic fiction, fantasy, uh, it takes you beyond that point as well. Actually, you imagine what life is like after the end of the world. Apocalypse, if you like, is the collective realisation of that. That's the point. It's the way of the entire species saying, ooh, look at us. We can imagine our own end. Aren't we great? You know, that's the paradox of, of, of apocalyptic imagining, is that apocalyptic imagining is actually bigs humanity up. The apocalyptic, as a form of cultural representation, is an indulgence. It is something that we uh, draw on as uh, one of the kind of core and most thrilling of our fantasies in, in, in modern life.